It's eight o'clock. Welcome to The Prophet Speak on Tribe TV. So good to have you with us today. Please start a watch party, share the link, invite your friends into this. We're going to have an incredible time in God together. We are just hearing the word of God from prophetic ministries around the world this week, speaking into this whole world of the pandemic, uh, life after lockdown. What should we be doing now? What should we be doing soon? Where is God leading us and what is he saying? And I've spoken to people in Australia, in America, in South Africa. That's where we're going tonight. And prophets around the UK. And you know what? There's an incredible amount of clarity and alignment and power being released in this time. So tonight, as I said, we're going to go to South Africa and we're going to meet a friend of mine called Pastor John Bassman. Now, you call him pastor, but really he's a He's a prophet. He's a remarkable, wonderful guy. And I've actually just about lived in his house for uh, six, seven weeks at a time when I was young and itinerant and crazy. And I used to spend a lot of my time in South Africa. And so I really got to know John well. And I know he's a remarkable ministry, sees remarkable miracles and has a wonderful church there just outside Johannesburg in South Africa. So he was one of the first ones I got in touch with and said, John, what is God saying right now? Can you share some stuff with us? And he has five powerful prophetic points, things that he believes God is saying right now for us. So let's head to South Africa on Zoom and let's talk to Pastor John Vassaman. Beautiful. All right, Pastor John, have you got five things that you believe God is saying right now? Number one, posture. You need to adopt the right posture. So and in the posture, you know, there's a couple of things. You know, the, the book of Ephesians is sit, walk, and stand. But I think we miss one out. And so, you know, we need to understand that we are seated in the heavenly realms. So when Jesus died, you know, Revelations 1, Revelations 5, he said that his blood, by his blood, he redeemed us to be kings and priests. But not only kings and priests to rule and reign on, on this earth, he also um, redeemed us to be prophets. Prophets were also anointed. Um, in the Old Testament and right through into the New Testament. So we need to understand that we are seated in the heavenly realms. We operate. Paul says in Philippians, let your conversation be as from heaven. And that word conversation is your entire lifestyle as well as your speech. Yeah. And so, so it's that being seated in the heavenly realms, first posture. The second is walking, walking the walk every single day of our lives. Um, it's interesting um, the last one is stand, and I already mentioned that in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 with the whole armor of God. The, the amazing thing is that the sit, walk, and stand, when Paul finishes the armor of God, he immediately moves into the sword of the Spirit in our mouths, but then on, on to prayer, be praying for all the saints with every kind of prayer request on all occasions. So sit, walk, stand, and, and that's exactly the theme of Psalm 1, isn't it? Blessed is the man who does not. You know, and so yeah. our, our posture really is like the tree planted by streams of living water and our leaves don't wither. And of course, that theme is carried through in Jeremiah 17. And he says, even the heat won't scorch us and the drought won't affect us. We're planted by rivers of living water. So, so let's look at it. Sit, walk, stand. But then in Ephesians 3 from verse 14, Paul says, um, uh, uh, you know, I kneel before the father, you know, for the family from whom it derives its name, you know. And so Paul talks about this, uh, this posture of kneeling and in prayer. And, and that's the one that I really, really want to focus on because for me, um, it depends on, it, it's, it's also uh, dependent on how we stand and walk and how we sit. But um, the, the amazing thing is um, Andrew Murray, our Andrew Murray, not your Andrew Murray, <laughs> Andrew Murray from, from a few decades ago said this, Live in the bold and holy confidence that God is able to bless his church through you. Now, I want to change that and put the world. Live in the holy and the bold confidence that God is able to change the world through you. God is really only waiting for prayer in order to give the blessing. Wow. And I, I feel like maybe God just hits a reset button with, with this whole thing. And, and, and just given us the opportunity to get away and to reset and revalue on a lot of things. And so, um, you know, we see the prayers of um, Elijah mentioned in James chapter 5, how, how, you know, he brought change over an entire nation. And, and, and James says he was a man of like passions as us. And so he took the posture of prayer and brought a nation back to God. So if, if God can use one man, what can he do with a praying church? 
wow. um, across the world. And you know, you live closer there than what I do. Christine and Peggy Smith, 184, 182, one partially crippled, one blind in that town of Barvas in one of the little black cottages, playing, praying for the island of Lewis. And they couldn't even go to church. I mean, they were in permanent physical lockdown. And, 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 and the Hebridean revival, I mean, you know a lot about revivals. It was the most pervasive and invasive as far as societal change of all revivals. And, and so the, the inestimable, inestimable power of prayer um, is something I figure that we haven't captured. And I don't think that if, you know, the devil is in, involved anywhere, I think he's totally underestimated the power of prayer. I like what Alfred Lord Tennyson said, pray for my soul. And I think he went on to say, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, lift your voice, rise like a fountain day and night. Beautiful. And so prayer, I believe, is, is part of our response. So the posture is the first one. Great. I love that. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a move of prayer stirring Ooh. all over the world like now. I think in ways that I've never seen before, even before this lockdown started. Yeah. And um, I, I, with regarding Brexit and the United Kingdom, um, a, a prophecy I released a little while ago, uh, spoke about the, the shifting that was going on regarding Brexit was leading to a move of prayer and it began yeah. to happen. Well, that's gone through the roof now. It's yeah. incredible. So I love that. Okay, what's the second one? Well, just, I just want to respond on that quick before we go to the second one. The, 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 the amazing thing for me was the, a lot of the prayer initiative and that we see in South Africa is not even great prayer leaders and great prayer warriors. It, it's almost a spirit of intercession that rose up yeah. in, in, in every believer. Yeah. And it's not like massive, massive prayer initiatives. I mean, that tells me, that tells me that something is happening. You know, it's I, I think it was, um, uh, oh, maybe it was Smith Wigglesworth that said that I'm under correction, but he said, but whenever there's a heaviness, Whenever there's almost a dearth of the presence of God, he said, understand that, that what you're picking up is the, 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 the pregnancy of prayer that's about to bring something forth. Wow. And um, Smith Wigglesworth said, and I've noticed that every time in our church, whenever there seems to be a heaviness and an atmosphere, I don't react to it negatively. I react to it positively because it's almost people are picking up this burden, almost like, Lot was for the city of Sodom, cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, but they were just picking up this prayer burden. And I think that it's there. And for me, the amazing thing about the prayer initiative, sure, there are prayer warriors leading it, but it's, the, it's just that response of the ordinary believers responding to the spirit of God and rising up. Beautiful. I mean, be, just before going into lockdown, I say just before, maybe we started six weeks before. So it's even before talk of the virus became yeah. uh, a, a common thing. We started to devote about half an hour of our Sunday morning service to praying all together as several hundred people in our main campus, yeah. um, which is something we've never done before for half an hour. We've done it for five or 10 minutes, but yeah. every Sunday that we could. And there was amongst what you might call perhaps some quite nominal believers this hungering for yeah. prayer and presence. And like you say, as you, as you talked about the absence of presence l coming just before a fresh move, it made me think of a tsunami and how the tide goes out in an yes, extreme yeah. way mm -hmm. just before it pushes back in. Amen. Wow. Come Powerful. on. I love that. I love so a move of prayer. That's our posture. Get on your knees and fight like a man. <laughs> hey, absolutely. <laughs> Come on. The only, the only army that advances on its knees. So I yeah, love that. The prayer, you know, is something that, that I've really felt. The second thing is I, I, I feel like it's um, reevaluating and reassessing our purpose. And and just having a look at so the posture was the first one and the purpose was the first. Um, you know, we we sometimes as a church, I think, um, fall into a trap where we feel maybe we're insignificant or irrelevant. I like what uh, Vice President Pence said just in the preliminary speech um, with, with President Trump when President Trump handed over to him and uh, just before they were announcing the lockdown in America and how Vice President Pence was asking people and saying to uh, um, uh, not asking people, but, but um, 
thanking the church and he referred to them as the faith community. He was referring to them and he was saying, I want to thank the faith community uh, for their prayers. He said, because it is, it always has and always will make such a difference. Wow. And he was encouraging the churches to pray. And then he opened up and said, for everyone to pray. And, uh, and then he encouraged online, you know, worldwide TV, he encouraged every believer to keep tithing and giving and donating to their faith communities because he said, because we need them. And I think sometimes we feel like we're a little bit of a, a voice in the wilderness. Now, particularly I'm talking about ordinary everyday member who maybe just attends church and maybe not in a high leadership position, but every prayer is significant. Every single prayer, every single prayer is powerful. We pray in our, our limited understanding, but God is able um, to, to um, facilitate that prayer or take that prayer and to give it, give it maximum effect. And, you know, we see that in Revelations 8, you know, where the prayers of the saints ascended like incense. And then the angel took the coal of the altar and hurled it back to earth, and there was a response on earth. You know, Isaiah, when he says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So, you know, in that prayer, there's always a response from heaven to make sense of our prayers. You know, I think always, you know, the most underestimated people are, are very often, you know, the, the Peggy Smiths yeah. and your sister. And, you know, somewhere in the middle of Africa, people who, who don't know, but the spirit of prayer and intercession comes upon them and they're praying in the spirit and they don't know what they're praying, but they're praying world shaping, world changing prayers. And so, you know, part of our purpose as well is we've got to remember that we have a message and uh, the message that we have is powerful. You know, it's the Evangelion, it's the good news. And uh, the message that we have has the power to change people's lives. And so, I mean, we live in absolutely incredible days. You think in the last pandemic, there was no social media. I mean, people were isolated. They were really isolated. What did they do? But, but we have got a powerful voice more now than ever before. And uh, the message that we have is really powerful. So, so I really found like we needed to, to uh, get back to our purpose. Every, every single church needs to reassess their purpose in, um, you know, in what God has called them to, what their flavor is, and, uh, and some of the words that you use, uh, you know, your culture, you know, and, and reassess your purpose and go forward. It's, it's really interesting. Um, there's a farmer out in KwaZulu-Natal here in South Africa, and just randomly the other morning, he sent me a message and he, um, a prophetic word, and, and basically, it's exactly what I'm saying. So and God really spoke to me, been really speaking to me, and he said, he said, I want you to sharpen your focus like an arrow. Wow. And he said, there's a lot of stuff you need to let go of. And he said, you need to focus on the things that I've called you to do. It was such a word from this farmer, you know. And um, so I was really blessed by, by that. So I, I, I really feel we need to reassess our purpose. Every single one of us, you know, every single member of the church, whether you're leader of a church, attending a church, just reassess your purpose, your kingdom purpose before God, and then throw yourself into that. I don't know who it was that said that, find out what God is doing your, in your day and then yeah. throw yourself into it wholeheartedly. Yeah. I think the worst thing we could do right now is just go back to normal afterwards, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I think that we, we have a reprieve. We've, we've just been given this time as, as a gift and I, and I know the world is suffering. I know economies are suffering and business is suffering and some people are suffering physically, but by and large, if we take the bigger picture, we've been given a, a reprieve to, just to reassess our purpose and, and what it is that we're going to do. Um, you know, we've got access. Everybody now has got a platform. Everybody can be a preacher on Facebook. You know, some good <laughs> Better and some, off or worse, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. However, you know, it's a little bit like Paul said, some preach, you know, out of, you know, competition. Some pe people preach, you know, out of, you know, wanting to get some, some kind of gain. He said, however, Christ has preached at the end of the day. That's, that's the brilliant news. Yeah, the airwaves so, have so, never been so full of the gospel. Amen, amen. The airwaves have been taken over, and that, I believe, is one of the seven mountains that the church yeah. for years was talking about. And suddenly, we've got, we've got um, you know, stuff, electronic um, stuff that's available to us, more or less affordable, and we can get things out of it. We can impact the globe. Yeah. And so all of the networks, you know, um, I, I remember when WWW first started, I always referred to it as God's World Wide Web. Yeah. And, and so, you know, God is using it. So, you know, what some people see is for evil purposes, you know, we see as for righteous purposes. So the yeah. second one is our purpose. 
Beautiful. I love that. I, yeah. 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 I, and I think I've been telling people because it is a confusing time. And I, and I feel if we, if we say everything's about to change and nothing will be the same again, which is, which is absolutely true. But also I think the thing to remember is the prophetic words, the long-term ones, they don't no. change. No. Uh, God's purpose is still to reach the world for the kingdom yeah. to come for his glory to cover the earth as the waters yeah. cover the sea. So we've just got to sometimes give up some of our pet projects and get yeah. into his purpose. So God, God give us clarity. Yeah. That's wonderful. What's your third one? The third one, what I felt um, was priority. Just get back our priorities, our value systems. It's really interesting, isn't it amazing that when, when we have something, we don't value it. When it's taken away, we yeah. start to value it. And it's now, you know, I'm seeing people in my church who come to church every now and then, and uh, now they're messaging me and saying, I can't wait for church. <laughs> you know? I was like, okay. So yeah. it, it took a pandemic to get you hungry for God, you know. Yeah. So, but people are missing church, and I, and I feel like, it's an opportunity for us to re, re attach value to the things that are valuable. Yeah, very good. And, um, you know, just being able to spend time at home, and I'm sure you're also enjoying the time at home with Vicky, Victoria and Zach, and, and there's some good quality time. And I know a lot of parents are saying, where would I have got four weeks to spend with my baby? You yeah. know, formative time in their life. So, so there's a lot, a lot that we can redeem, a lot that we can take it out, take out of it. But, but for me, is that we re need to um, reattach value where the value belongs. Very good. And and we've had a time to reflect. And for me, um, the principles of God's word. Something that's absolutely blessed me about our church is that the giving continued unabated. In fact, in fact, people got more generous in this time. Yeah. You know, um, the income has gone up in, in this time when, when we're not having church services. And so what they've done is they've discovered a principle, obviously, over years, you know, it's works in their lives. And, and now in the worst of times, a bit like Jacob in a time of famine, sowing seed. And, and, um, and so, you know, the giving got a priority. Prayer has got a priority. And I think a lot of people will take away from this family time is going to take a priority but then yeah. also in its in its proper place of order um church you yeah. know we're discovering yeah you know um we really would like to see each other again <laughs> yeah you know be good to get a few hugs on a sunday morning and, <laughs> and uh, sit in the coffee shop and fellowship around the word and well, you know we're, so, we're social I, beings yeah and, and, and a lot of the ministry takes place informally in church outside of the sermon slot yeah and, yeah. and we're missing that. And so I think we're going to rediscover a new value in, value in that koinonia, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that yeah. communion between brethren. I think what's being revealed in this time was as soon as we couldn't meet on a Sunday in the normal way, um, everybody that was genuinely connected relationally was able to carry on because they, we call it church is living life in circles, not in rows. In other words, Rose on a Sunday morning never was church. It was a celebration of church, but it wasn't church. Yeah, exactly. Church is really lived in circles. And so what we found that the easy thing is everybody that was in circles, in other words, they had genuine friends and people that they do life with or do purpose with, you know, the two are so linked. They were all fine, needed nothing. Suddenly it's the ones that went, actually, I just attend on a Sunday. I don't have people to call. And so they're having to rely on pastoral systems and stuff like that, which is, which is fine. But what it shows is there's not a priority to build relationships. So Absolutely. I think for those people, some are going to go, wow, I'm really glad my roots go into the house of God relationally. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And others are going to go, wow, I discovered I went to church, but I was alone. Exactly. And, and you can't blame the pastor for that. That's something that every one of us builds. So I just pray out of this, we're going to value yeah. Wow, I, I've got to build and entangle my roots with other people in the house of God. So I have genuine friends. People don't want to go to a friendly church. They want friends. Absolutely. It's completely different. Love it. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think those are the ones that are feeling alone now. Yeah. You know, they feel lonely. They feel isolated. They feel cut off um, because they're outside of, as you say, those circles of, of intimate friendship. 
and relationship in the church. So, so I, I felt that, you know, the priority and the values, value system, God is exposing, you know, the lack of it, but also revealing where we do have it. And so I think that's an important thing. And there's other things as far as, um, you know, priority is concerned. You know, uh, Paul talks about that with Timothy, and he says it several times through Timothy's letters, God, the good deposit that was entrusted to you. And we know that it's the gospel and the body of truth. Yeah. But, um, and he, as well, but in, in um, one, one reference, I think he mentions it about three times. He says, guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And, and so, and, and so the, 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 the valuing of our value system and yeah. giving it its proper order of priority is another thing that we can take out of this. So I, I was just chatting with Prophet Andre Bronkhorst and a, a, prophet, um, a pastor contacted him from America and he said, you know, I feel like the church is irrelevant. Hmm. And I, I think that would have been a reflection of his own heart because I, you know, for me, I feel the church is extremely relevant. Yeah. I mean, we could get more relevant, but um, you know, sometimes our relevance is, it's not measured, you know, because we have a spiritual influence in this world. Yeah. You know, um, you know, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Then he said to the disciples, you, the light, you, you, the city set on the hill. And, and for me, one of the things that I believe the world is looking for at this point in time is, okay, we've heard what you've said. Now we're looking to see how you handle this because the world wants an alternative lifestyle. Yeah. You know, yeah. it wants to believe what we're preaching. And so, and of course, if, if we present that and the way that we're coping in this particular time, um, I think it's going to shout a lot louder than what a lot of our, our words have said, you know, the way yeah. that we respond. And I think that's why we need to come out with it with, you know, you know, our posture right, our purpose right, our priorities right, and then, you know, you know, all of those things. So beautiful. Yeah. I think it, even if the church is just a a bastion of peace in a terrified world, that's huge. When people go, What you know, why aren't you freaking out about the economy? And I was like, Well, I, I never had faith in the economy. Why aren't no. you freaking out about politics and Brexit and all that? Well, I, I never put my faith there. It's like Jesus walked into occupied Israel and yeah. he never attacked the Romans. There were just there were just human things that he was just thirty thousand feet above in God's purpose. Yeah. And I think we've got to get through that posture of prayer and the sense of God's purpose we get our priorities right. And so there are things shaking that, that won't affect us in the same way. It doesn't mean we won't grieve if someone dies or we won't no, hurt course. and something's painful. We do, of course, all of those yeah. things. But we have a peace that passes understanding. Amen. Amen. So if, yeah, and we keep our course. Yeah. You know, it's unaltered. You know, I, I agree with you when we come out of this, the world is a different place. But in, in many senses, it's going to be the same place. Yeah. You know, in, in many senses, the church is going to be different. In many senses, church is going to be the same. We're still going to gather. We're still going to worship. Exactly. We're still going to pastor. We're yeah. still going to preach the gospel. I just pray we get better at it. And I think Absolutely. a huge thing, and it's probably a leadership thing in the, in the church, is, is we're very good at time wasting. Yeah. And, and we're, we get very good. We all do it. I'm not going to pretend I don't for one yeah. moment. We all get good at playing church. Yeah. And I think we need to get back to the heart of church and to, 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 to a life lived walking with God and yeah. doing what he calls us to do, that will result in the kind of fruitfulness Jesus had. Absolutely. And Jesus wants us yeah. to have. So beautiful. Absolutely. I love that. What's your fourth one? The fourth one is um, rediscovering passion. Come on. You know, isn't it amazing how, you know, in the cut and thrust of ministry, you know, I, I was shocked many years ago when... <laughs> A senior pastor told me, I mean, I was still in baby feet walking into the ministry. And he said, the easiest place to backslide is in the ministry. Oh, yeah. And, and um, you know, I mean, I was shocked because we can, you know, it's a cliche almost. We can become so busy with the things of God, we forget God. And uh, so some of, the, some of the time that I've had here is just rediscovering my passion. Now more than ever before, I want to, I want to preach the gospel. I want to preach the word. I want to see people healed. I want to you know, um, just enjoy the move of the spirit again, you know, and, and see revival coming to whole countries like, like what happened with us in Armenia and, uh, and, and stuff like that. So there's been a rekindling of my passion. And, and, and I believe it's something that God wants to do in this time. If we will get away from, 
all the other stimulus that comes to all of the other senses. And I believe that's what Paul means when he says it in Hebrews 5 and going on into Hebrews 6, when he talks about our senses trained to discern good and bad. And, um, you know, we have five gateway senses that receive knowledge from a physical world, but we've got equally got five spiritual senses that, that pick up, you know, uh, you know, knowledge from the spiritual world, you know? And so, so those two are parallel, but isn't it amazing how very often the five physical senses dominate the five spiritual senses. Yeah. So we need to have our five natural senses disciplined and trained so they don't override and overrule what God is speaking. So, you know, my mind can be shouting louder than what, what God's peace is, you know? Yeah. So the, the, anx the anxiety and the thoughts and the things that, that come can be overruling those spiritual senses. And so, you know, um, for me, you know, to get back to hearing the voice of God, getting back into the presence of God, getting back into relating to that realm. And I think it's like what you said, you know, Jesus didn't walk, um, didn't, when he walked into occupied Israel, didn't attack the Romans. It was because he had a complete sense of another kingdom and another yeah. purpose. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. And, and so, you know, we're, we're of the kingdom. So, so those things, those stimulus shouldn't affect our passion, but we get involved and we lose our passion. The weariness, discouragement, disillusionment, all of those kind of things come in. And it's just to get our heads out and our heads back up. It's really interesting that uh, it was written about Jesus, quoted from the Old Testament, that zeal for your house will accomplish this, um, you know. And, yeah. and so Jesus had an incredible zeal for the, the house of God and was reflected in the time of the cleansing of the temple. And, um, you know, Paul said it in Romans chapter 12, you know, he said, keep your spiritual fervor, never be lacking in zeal, uh, the NIV translation says. And, and, and I think that we've been doing a lot of stuff. Many people have been and have a lot of zeal, but, but just um, picking up, I was watching, um, I've got to just think of his name again now, but anyway, he, he posted something on prayer and he went into the lockdown and um, this, this particular uh, pastor, he's more of a, an evangelist missionary, but um, he went into the lockdown in fasting and prayer and, and his passion Jared, it did something to me. It, it struck the deepest chord in my heart when he came online and he began to just talk about how he is going into prayer and he's praying for his world and he burst into tears, this big, strong American guy and, and, and started sobbing on the, on, you know, online. The, the absolute passion just gripped my heart and I realized, you know, if I was busy, I might not have watched that video, yeah. that clip, but it, it absolutely gripped my heart and I felt a real stir um, for passion for the things of God, the things of the kingdom, ministry again, that I think I got lost in, 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 um, in the busyness. And so I think it's one of the things that the Lord is using this time um, to help us rediscover um, that passion, passion for everything, passion for yeah. the word, passion for our families, passion for everything. I just can't wait to get up and preach to real people now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm real. <laughs> no, you're real, but I mean, not, not online. You know what I mean? No, I know what you're saying. I yeah. know. It, it's, it's so easy. I mean, for me and for people that will be watching this right now, I think the, 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 one of the keys, or awful word, I know, but, but what, one of the keys to staying fresh is to admit when you're not really honestly i yeah. mean I, I i look in the mirror at least once a month sometimes a lot more than that and go you're a bit backslidden cooper yeah you know whatever you've been distracted by this or you're just tired or sometimes i can hear the irritability in my head now i'm, I'm old yeah. enough and wise enough to not let it out yeah you know or, or i see something on social media and i can feel the envy rise in my heart now i'm wise enough to not ca continue that thought because yeah. inside i go oh why have you got a shriveled heart cooper what's going on yeah yeah, yeah. and right you know my, my heart isn't it, there's no sense of abundance and the love of god and the joy and i think it, um uh, an, another key for people number one admit when you're backslid it's okay yeah. i'm a pastor I yeah. get now I don't get freezing cold I get that awful place of lukewarm time and time yeah. again so to admit it is the beginning and then the second one is to not beat yourself up over it but to allow Absolutely. the love of God to warm your heart back up I, I think sometimes I've got a tendency to strive but it never really helps me break through if I'm really harsh yeah. with myself 
Yeah. Because I can do that. And prophetic people are like that too. They can be very harsh on themselves. They have very high expectations, perfectionist kind of spirit very often. Um, but often I have to become childlike and suddenly I burst into flame again. Yeah. Unsophisticated. Don't try and be what you're not really. Let the love of God lift you. And I pray that people watching this right now would allow that to happen if they're feeling Amen. a bit, Amen. you know, Amen. backslidden. And I'll yeah. be honest with you, I've been so busy this first month. It's not been Amen. an intimate month. It's been a very prophetic month, but that's something yeah. slightly different. Yeah. So I really feel you're right that bursting back into passion is what God wants to do. And it begins with honesty and it begins with letting his love hit your heart again instead of the work or trying to be something for God. Absolutely. Yeah. The great revivalists would recognize this, you know, and um, they would, when they lost the passion for souls would sit down and just take the word and read the word, you know, get aside, you know, yeah. but David uses the picture of the heart, you know, when he said my soul longs after it, but not only my soul, he said my flesh, you know, we, we, we crave the goosebump feeling and the, the physical awareness of his presence, of the anointing coming over us. And David knew, you know, that like a heart, he would be panting for the living waters. You know, we need to get aside and go and immerse ourselves in the river. Beautiful. Just immerse, jump in the stream, get in the stream. You know, I, I, I have two signs for me when I know that I'm losing a little bit of passion. And that is when, you know, somebody phones and there's a need or a problem in the church and I'm irritated. <laughs> <laughs> this phone call just irritated me. Yeah, I, I know. I've got, I've got to get aside and I've got to get with God, you know. And yeah. the second is, you know, once I, I was, I, I went to the, the fridge and I opened the fridge and I was looking inside, rummaging in the fridge and it was sort of latish in the, before I went to bed. And, and I was looking through, I was hungry for something and I didn't know what. And all of a sudden God spoke to me and he said, what you're hungry for is not in here. Yeah. And I, I stopped and I looked he said, what you're hungering for is in my presence. And I shut the door and I realized that I was hungering for God and I was translating it and, and, and reading it as a physical yeah. hunger. Yeah. Your soul has hunger pangs too, right? It's, it, they are spiritual hunger pangs. Taste yeah. and see that the Lord is good. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, Isaiah 55, come, you know, buy, eat and drink. And, and so we, we need to, sometimes if we're, overdoing television or overdoing sport or overdoing we're looking for something yeah. that we need to be finding and, and in the context of a balanced life i understand it but we're looking for something that we can only find in his presence and that's where we will rediscover the passion yeah you know i'm i'm a perfectionist by nature uh you know it's both a, a thing of value and a, a real weakness too that i can want things to be too perfect and I've found time and time again, God, God will say to me, because, you know, you know what church is like. Sometimes it's like herding cats. In other words, just, you know, you just get it all right. Then everything moves that and, yeah. and actually in different ways, everybody's life's like that, whether it's your kids yeah. or your job or just yeah. things happening around you. Um, life is incredibly imperfect, um, a little bit dysfunctional. That's real yeah. life. Yeah. And God said to me, do you know the only place you are going to find perfection when your soul can really breathe deeply is my presence. Because yeah. it's, the, it's the only perfect place is yeah. his presence. Amen. And, and what an opportunity, you know, that we, we have in lockdown, you know, to spend time with God. Yeah. To spend time in his presence, you know. Beautiful. So what, what an incredible thing. But anyway, time is marching, the fifth thing. Come on, yes. Go for Purity. it. Purity. Purity. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, like I said, the world is watching and they're wanting to believe what we say is true. And, um, but, but it's not only purity of our walk, Jared. I, I feel that um, <clears throat> so many people are trying to get revelation. <clears throat> and I think that too many people have moved away from the simplicity of the word of God. And so Paul said to Timothy, you know, he said, you know, watch your life and your doctrine closely. And I think we need to get back to the simplicity of the word. Um, I remember a, a, a pastor friend of mine phoning me and some guy put written a book and, you know, it was, you know, wrong doctrine and things like this. And he was saying, this is going to shake the world. And I said, no, it's, it's not going to shake the world. And I said, error has been out ever since the beginning. And I said, you know what, <clears throat> let's get back to just preaching the simple, pure word of God. Let's just Beautiful. preach the pure word. There's yeah. no antidote 
for the purity of the word. And, and so it's not only purity in our walk and purity in our thought life, but it's the purity of the word. Just get back to the pure word of God. And, and um, you know, sometimes we get overcomplicated and, and the most powerful messages always are the most simple messages. You know, there's just, there's just a power in the word of God without trying to find deep, heavy revelation. And, you know, a lot of prophetic people are, are guilty of that. <clears throat> Everybody wants to be the next revelator, you know. And um, sure, you know, the word is deep and it's real and it's, you know, there is a depth to it. But if we can just get back to the simplicity and the honesty of the word and keep that um, in this particular time, make it an uncomplicated, pure message that we preach to the world as well as walking, you know, in our lives. So Peter says in First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk. You know, the pure milk of the word. And, and so, you know, instead of getting fanciful, let's just get simpler and just get back to the, the basics of the word. I love it. And, and, and how about if we just lived like Jesus, exactly. doing, doing what we saw the father doing? Exactly. You know, I, I get that five-year plans are useful if you've got a lot of staff and, you know, multi-million pound turnovers. Um, but that's, that's not my world. Actually, what we really want to live is a life where we've got the space and time like Jesus. Jesus turned the world upside down by just watching the father and fulfilling and that absolutely. strategy for three short years in a very small geographic space. Yeah. I think we've got to get back to that simplicity. That's beautiful. Yeah. The, the simplicity of it. I, I mean, I agree with you. That was Jesus hold M O the words that I speak. I got yeah. from my father, the things that I'm doing, I, I got from the father. And, you know, a few years ago, um, Jared, I, I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to tell you this, but a few years ago, God told me to shut everything down. He said, close everything down, every, your home cells, your Bible school, close everything down, all of your meetings, just keep Sunday morning service, you know, with the children's church part of it. And uh, I went to my leaders and I said, this is what God's told me to do. And they just, the first thing they said, and, and not, you know, it's not a critical thing. They just said, but what about the finances? You know, the more meetings, the more finances. And I said, I said, all right. I said, if the finances goes up, we know that we've, I've heard from God. Because that was the first thing I asked God. I said, but if the finances goes down, we'll change it immediately. And from that time, our finances started to climb. And we wow. just had, only meeting was a Sunday morning service. And then God said to me, now you only implement and build what I tell you to build when I tell you to do it. Come on. And, and, um, and so that has been the situation. And, and um, you know, for years I itinerated and that's how I met you. And then we were on um, Spirit Word Channel. I think my viewership was um, second to Prophet Kerbis is around about 2 million people a month all over the world um, watching Global Effect. But all of that was just when God told me I did it and he supplied, um, miraculous supply. And then um, two prophets uh, came and prophesied to me that God was changing my ministry. And you know, Jared, I didn't do anything different. I kept on doing exactly the same. And suddenly members from our church were going out and then other churches were connecting with. And now we have a network of, of pastors. I think we're heading up to about 18 churches now, 18 or 19 churches. Beautiful. And some of them we helped, some of them we haven't. Some, one of our churches, um, they've got 13 churches under them. And, um, you know, wow. so... So the whole thing grew, and it's exactly like you said, um, you know, getting back to the pure simplicity, the purity and the simplicity of uh, the modus operandi of Jesus, hearing, seeing, and doing. It's a real, it's a, it's a huge challenge. What it, it, God said this to me um, a couple of years ago. What if you just did the things I told you to do and wow. nothing more? Wow. You know, we, we'd, be, we'd be less busy, we'd be less stressed, we'd be less sure. envious, we'd be less competitive, but we yeah. might be a hundred times more fruitful. What if we just did that? Beautiful. Yeah. I love it. And I think the purity as well is, is going back to what you said of just what God is telling you to do. And I think sometimes I like what Johan van Rensburg, uh, he's been helping me out with praise and worship on my live stream, Prophet Kurvis' son. And uh, he said to me, you know, Bethel's band is for Bethel's church. Yeah. You know, he said, your band is for your church. Bethel's band has a sound that goes with what God is doing there. Yeah. And, and, and the church is famous, famous at, you know, um, 
what is Xeroxing, you know? Yeah, Photos cop, cop, copy and paste, you know. Copy and paste. <laughs> yeah, photocopying you know, everything. We all got carbon paper. And, you know, what yeah. this church does, we do because we're insecure and because we haven't got our relationship with the Lord. So yeah. that's good advice for any pastors that are watching. It would be amazing. All right, let me do those five again. Posture, which is about mainly prayer. Prayer, yeah. Purpose, what's our real purpose? This is still all about the kingdom of God coming and the gospel reaching the nations. Can't change. The glory of God covering the earth. Uh, a time to reprioritize. Yeah. Passion, get our passion back. And purity. I yeah. think, uh, and again, um, I was prophesying this from the beginning of the year. It's, uh, we've been in a, a season of the goodness and the joy and the grace of God and the mercy. And all the yeah. songs have been about that. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Um, but now we're coming into a new season. And it's not that that will go, but it'll be a season of the fear of the Lord as well. Yeah. And this sense of, come on, let's get our, our sense of holy reverence. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean somber reverence necessarily, but holy reverence that we really are pure. Before yeah, that. that respect for God again, you know? Yeah. The yeah. church needs to respect for God. You know, we, we become almost flippant in our, and, 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 and it's great. You know, the Lord wants us to be, you know, him first to be our Abba daddy and all this kind of thing. But, but just in, in reference to just even the word father, our father, you know, when people talk about daddy and Abba, there's almost too much of a familiarity for my liking. Yeah. He's not, he's not father Christmas. Exactly. And if, yeah. you, if, if, you, if you think about it, I remember as you, as you say that, I'm thinking about teachers in school. You know, yeah. the really good teachers weren't the ones that had no gravitas, that just let the class go chaotic because they, exactly. they were just kind of nice and they wanted to be liked by the kids yeah. or they, just, they were out of their depth. The yeah. best teachers were the ones you actually had a little bit of an awe or fear of that they, they, yeah. they, they you know, there was a strength to them. There yeah. was a, they, but... They were also fun, interesting, joyful, and loving. And yeah. you, they, they, there was something holistically whole about them. And that's, that's who God is. And so, Absolutely. yeah, there's got to be that awe as well. Um, yeah, there, there's got to be a respect and a reverence. You know, that, that old statement, familiarity breeds contempt. Yeah. And some people are just far too familiar with God. At the end of the day, he's my heavenly father. He's the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But, hey, he's God. Yeah. <laughs> And, and you, you know, I was in a meeting recently with about 30 apostles from around the country. And there were, uh, let's just say, quite high ranking guys from some of the, from some of the main churches in, in this country. And one of them was saying that the press was saying to the church, Big C in, in Great Britain, phrases like in these meetings, can you stop being just so nice? You're supposed to be otherworldly. You're not supposed to agree with us. You're supposed okay. to bring, you talk about sin and hell and angels and demons. Stop trying to just be like us because yes. we will miss you. And that was an atheist reporter saying that to the church in our nation. We've got to stop. This is the thing. I think if we make God Father Christmas, the church also just becomes this nice wing of kind of kind social action and nothing more. Exactly. Whereas we've absolutely got to be kind, but when the fear of God hits us, we will have the chance to actually bring the glory of God to the nation. Absolutely. I mean, every revival brought that sense of the fear of God. I think it was um, David Wilkerson when he was preaching to the druggies in, in New York. I remember um, in, in his, his attempt to, bridge the, the vast gap between the two cultures, you know, himself, you know, being sort of a farm boy, country, country kid. And uh, these, these rough um, druggies, he started to talk the lingo like them, you know, and uh, he was trying to use their language and speak to them. And then the one kid sitting right down on the floor in the front, really high and spaced out, looked at him and he said, hey, preacher man, don't try and be like us. Just you say it like it is. Say it the way you say it. Come on. And, and just there, you know, and it's what I said right at the beginning. The world is looking for a different alternate kingdom society. They want us to be different. You know, if the moment we compromise, we lose our message. Yeah, love it. Well, Pastor John, it's been wonderful to have you wonderful with us. Thank you so much for those five points. Um, I just pray they really transform lives as they hear them. Yeah. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Bless you, brother. Thank you. Wow, wasn't that incredible? Five 
powerful things for us to meditate on there. Really let God speak to your heart about the things that he's doing and how he wants us to live in this season. Do connect up with John Vassarman. The details of his church will be in the notes with this program's powerful ministry and he broadcasts quite often so you could be really blessed by connecting with his church. It's a remarkable, remarkable place. In fact, I was supposed to be doing a summit pretty much right now over there, but of course, here we are now in lockdown. So in this remarkable season, we really are wanting to connect you with some great ministries. And uh, uh, one of the soundtracks of my lockdown has been somebody called Ryan Gilpin, who's out in Australia, and he's been releasing some beautiful music in this unusual season. So I wanted to bring you some of his songs. And um, this one is called Winter Is Over. And uh, I just had it on repeat in my house at times. It's just a wonderful, wonderful track. And you know what? God is the God of changing seasons. So this song about the winter to spring change is something that we really need to take note of. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. I'll put the details of how to connect with Ryan in the notes with this program. But as we end, enjoy this song right now. Winter is over. Let a season change begin in your life. After pain 
Well, I hope tonight God has encouraged you or touched your life in some way. Please leave a comment or email us. We'd love to hear from you if you've been encouraged by these broadcasts. There is a free album waiting for you to download if you sign up to our e-news. And now if you stick around, I'm going to tell you about the tribe, our online learning community. And if you want to come and get involved in that and get connected and stay connected to us in the future, then uh, join our tribe. Hi, I'm Jared Kiva. I want to tell you about The Tribe. The Tribe is our global online learning community made up of uh, believers, leaders, pastors, influencers, artists, all devoted to growing in God together. We're passionate about the things of the Spirit, growing in prophecy, miracles, signs, wonders. We're, we're passionate about revival and the reformation of society, God doing something that will transform the world around about us. And we're passionate about great leadership, doing things with skill and integrity that, again, and will impact the world around about us. There's three tiers to the tribe. The basic level is learn, and that's access to our growing library, over 400 units of video, audio, and e-courses to grow you in your faith and walk with God. There's a private Facebook group, an Instagram group, where you can interact with others and with us in a more live way. Tier two is called lead, and it's our global leadership tribe, where we add a lot more leadership content. As soon as you join, you get four of my books on leadership and how to grow in the area of leadership and every book that we write during your membership you will get for free sent to you as an ebook. And then that tier has its own private Facebook group and Instagram group where you can connect with others that are growing in the same journey. Tier three is an extension of tier two, really. It's called Lead Plus, and it's where you can take your whole team, up to 10 people, and have them join under one membership so you're all learning and growing together. I want to invite you to join us on this journey. Join us in the Facebook group, the Instagram group, where we can interact together and then enjoy the massive amount of teaching on the tribe zone that could absolutely transform your ministry. Isn't it wonderful that we can connect around the world like this now with the power of the internet? Let's use it for good and let's walk together and grow together in the things of God.